good evening hello viewers and my dear students this is dr dipankar parvi assistant professor department of english hg college kharagpur west medinapur west bengal it is the continuation lecture of my previous one as in my previous one i have already discussed the introductory part of a famous poet john keats's one famous ode ode to a nightingale and i have explained there some of the literary terms like keats's hellenism keats's sensuousness his uses of negative capability and how romantic poetry is different uh, from uh, classical poetry all these aspects i have already discussed there and today i am going to read the entire poem put to a nightingale and analyze each and every word rather i should say i would like to analyze in between the lines of the entire poem in these two video lectures two means i have uh, minded to divide the entire poem into two halves two video lectures because it's a long poem of eight stanzas and uh, within a single video lecture i cannot incorporate the entire poem of eight stanzas so i have to decide that i divide the entire poem into two parts the first part or the first video lecture will be dealing with the first four stanzas of this particular ode and the rest four stanzas will be dealt in the next video lecture so uh, let us start with the history of the uh, origin of this particular uh, ode ode to a nightingale by john keats this particular poem is uh, keats's real genius and it reflects uh, some of the great qualities of keats's poetic art and this particular poem was uh, a real inspiration from uh, the song of a nightingale that particular uh, bird nightingale was uh, had built had built a nest in one of the branches in a plum tree in the backyard of keats's uh, garden and uh, before i start uh, i need to explain the term nightingale nightingale is a, a particular uh, bird of thrush family and it is known for its beautiful and powerful song and generally this bird sings in the uh, time of spring in india uh, from uh, february last to uh, may first uh, generally this nightingale uh, bird sings and this is the time for their mating and uh, this bird is uh, symbolizes the spring season even in uh, uh, england also we uh, found that uh, this bird nightingale uh, sings in that particular uh, time of the uh, season so uh, it is a bird of thrush family uh, with a beautiful and powerful uh, uh, song and uh, uh, it's a real genus of that particular uh, bird so uh, this particular poem was written in the year of uh, 1819 and in the month of may when uh, it is uh, uh, it is told that uh, in the garden of spaniard inn or might be uh, uh, according to one of his best friends it's his best friend uh, charles armitage uh, uh, who told that uh, the story uh, of uh, the origin of this particular poem that under a plum tree in the garden of kiss's house this uh, poem was constructed this poem was written so according to uh, brown according to brown a nightingale had built its nest near his home and in the spring of 1819 and keats was really inspired by the bird song and uh, composed this particular poem in a single day and published in the annals of the uh, fine arts uh, uh, one of his friends best friends uh, charles armitage uh, who uh, told 
the story behind writing of this particular poem that uh, when uh, Keats heard the uh, spectacular uh, uh, singing of this nightingale and he was so perplexed and mesmerized by the song of the nightingale, he suddenly took uh, one of his dining chair from uh, the backyard of his uh, uh, courtyard and uh, suddenly uh, went under the uh, plume tree and sat over there for hours and composed this particular ode of eight stanzas in some uh, um, torn uh, separated eight pieces of papers and by that uh, time he wrote the poem he fell asleep there and uh, those eight pieces or small pieces of papers on which the poem was really uh, composed by John Keats who were blown away by the wind and it was scattered in the garden and later when he woke up from the sleep he collected all the eights uh, or uh, papers, pieces of papers on which he had written the poem and collected them and kept under uh, his uh, back and uh, came in the uh, backyard of his house and there he gave all these papers to his friend and the friend was so uh, uh, similar minded and uh, so intellectual uh, in understanding with the uh, frequency of mind of Keats that uh, he uh, read the entire poems in, uh, in um, separate seats and then arranged the poem uh, chronologically from the first to the last stanza from stanza 1 to stanza 8 and then showed it to Keats and Keats then approved that yes it was written in that order so uh, uh, this is the nice story behind the uh, composition of this particular ode an ode to a nightingale so uh, I have told the story because uh, it will inspire to read the poem before I proceed line by line analysis, word by word analysis of the poem. So let us now start or let us now begin with the first stanza of the uh, poem Ode to a Nightingale. So I start reading the first stanza. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense. As though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. One minute passed and lethe words had sung. It is not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, thou that thou lie twinge a dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full throated ease. So this is the fascinating stanza with which the poem begins and as I have told in my earlier uh, lecture that romantic poetry is essentially subjective poetry and it is um, uh, proved from the very first word my heart aches that means the persona the poet his heart is aching his heart is painful and a drowsy numbness pains my sense so what is numbness numbness is a kind of insensitivity numbness is a kind of uh, uh, um, uh, perplexity of the limbs and the limbs doesn't work so a drowsy numbness a kind of sleepy a kind of sleepy only understanding that comes into the body and the body doesn't perform the necessary work doesn't carry out the commands of the brain so it is a drowsy numbness that pains my senses so there are five senses the senses have been uh, already uh, hindered by a kind of numbness and it is being compared with as though of hemlock I had drunk that means the person of the poet has uh, uh, already taken a potion or uh, hemlock hemlock is supposed to be known as a poison and it is uh, obtained from a plant and Socrates the famous philosopher uh, who, who was supposed to spoil the brains of younger uh, students and uh, he was administered hemlock and he died of that particular uh, poison so a hemlock if we uh, take in a little amount that may cause a kind of numbness kind of drowsiness but when it is taken in a larger quantity then it might prove to be fatal and one may die out of this particular poison so the poet is comparing that his senses are being numbed by taking of hemlock a kind of poison that was administered to Socrates uh, before his death or third line 
or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and let the words had sunk or emptied some dull opiate opiate is uh, a kind of uh, uh, narcotic that is also known for its uh, uh, slumber or sleepiness that induces sleep so opium is used in medication and uh, when uh, a patient is suffering from uh, real trauma patient is suffering from uh, excruciating pain opium is administered and it gives uh, a kind of relief to the pain so the poet wants to the person wants to empty some dull opiate to the drains so he wants to uh, drink the last drop the to the lees of the lws to the lees of the uh, particular uh, beaker particular glass where this opiate is being stored so he cannot uh, lift a single drop of that opium why uh, uh, as if it is uh, he has taken that particular opium one minute past just one minute ago and lethe words had sung lethe is uh, it is an allusion it is an allusion to the uh, greek mythology where uh, lethe has been described as the river of forgetfulness so lethe is a river which is situated in hades that means it is uh, a river of the underworld and uh, that particular uh, river uh, um, if, if someone takes the water from that particular river and takes a little bit of water so it may uh, 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 give him a sense of forgetfulness that means he will forget everything uh, whatever he wants to remember so uh, lethe is the river of forgetfulness and uh, uh, um, uh, everyone uh, who wants to forget uh, uh, should take this particular uh, water from that uh, river so here uh, the analogy is that the poet the persona wants to forget the fright and fever the sufferings and the painfulness of this particular world the earth and wants to uh, uh, go away from this wants to elope wants to uh, uh, free uh, from this particular uh, worries uh, the pains the carefulness all sorts of things that exists in this uh, earth so uh, uh, let the words had sung it is then in the uh, fifth line uh, the poet says it is not through envy of thy happy lord but being too happy in thine happiness so it is not through envy of thy happy lord so the poet is saying that it is not through envy envy means jealousy envy means uh, enviousness that not it is not the enviousness it is not the jealousy of thy that means of your happy lord that means you are happy it is not for that but being too happy in thine happiness that means i am i am empathetic if the, there is a contrast between uh, these two words one is sympathy and another is empathy sympathy means uh, to feel with and empathy means to feel into so the poet is feeling into the uh, pain the feeling into the happiness the feeling into the happiness of that particular bird who is singing so melodiously uh, in the branch of that particular tree so the poet wants to flee from this want to elope from this uh, 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 full uh, of care full of uh, fever and fret life of, uh, on the earth and wants to mingle uh, in the world of imagination in the world of fantasy with uh, the nightingale uh, who is uh, sitting on the branch of that particular tree so here the poet wants to say that it is not envy of thy happy lord that means you are envy i am not envious uh, you are happy uh, i am not envy of your happiness but uh, i am too happy i am too happy in thine happiness that means you are happy and i am uh, after seeing your happiness i am also too much happy and that happiness brings tears into uh, my eyes so that thou light winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless singest of summer in full throated is these are the last four lines of the first stanza that thou that be you the nightingale light winged dryad so it is a very light it is not heavy it is a uh, light creature and dryad what is the meaning of dryad dryad is a wood nymph wood nymph according to the greeks a uh, dryad was a nymph inhabiting a tree and keeping a watch keeping a vigil uh, over it and uh, and in the next uh, next line uh, um, 
in some melodious plot of beech and green so melodious plot the plot is not melodious melodious means uh, which is uh, uh, melody melody means something uh, rhythmical something musical something uh, which um, pleases our senses uh, the acoustic uh, pleasure that we inherit so the plot is the plot means the grassy land full of grass the plot is not melodious it is a transferred epithet mm, transferred epithet means uh, an adjective which has been transferred from its original place to a uh, to another place to signify something else but here uh, uh, it is uh, it means that the place uh, the entire place become melodious uh, because of that sweet uh, nightingale song because of the uh, melodious uh, performance from the branch of a tree so uh, uh, the nightingale is performing its melodious song and that particular melodious song makes the entire plot melodious so it is not the plot melodious but the entire ambience the atmosphere becomes melodious and in some melodious plot of beech and green so beech and beech is a particular uh, uh, tree a kind of tree so uh, the beech, uh, the name of a tree, a green plot is full of beech trees and it is uh, 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 numerous, it is numberless. So beech is green and shadows numberless. So there are several trees and uh, the trees uh, have cast uh, their shadows and uh, so it has been uh, numberless shadows, countless shadows. Uh, countless shadows that is being emphasized here of beech and green and shadows numberless. Singest of summer in full throated is. So uh, it is eulogizing the nightingale is celebrating the summer. The celebrating uh, the summer. Summer is the uh, season of mellow fruitfulness. Uh, our seasons are quite different from the seasons of uh, England, the seasons of the European countries. Uh, so summer is something which is very pleasant there um, after uh, the snow, uh, snowfall, uh, when the snow uh, mails, uh, then uh, um, uh, uh, birds chirp, begin to chirp and the flowers uh, begin to uh, bloom and the new leaves come out in the branches and uh, it's a really uh, nice uh, natural phenomena uh, that is being shown in those European countries uh, full of um, uh, full of uh, winter uh, almost for nine months so summer was a kind of uh, season of mellow fruitfulness over there so uh, in that particular summer the nightingale is singing spontaneously and freely in full throated ease. That means uh, nothing hinders the song to come out from the throat of the nightingale. It is coming automatically like the fountain in a mountain and uh, the singing doesn't hinder anything. So here we can compare also uh, uh, Sally Schuyler uh, who is pouring its full heart. We have uh, read also Sally Schuyler. So there we have seen that the Schuyler is also pouring its full heart. So uh, this is the essence of the first stanza. Now we would like to uh, read out the uh, second stanza. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved art, testing of flora and country green dance and provocal song and sunburned mart oh for a fool uh, oh for a beaker full of worms out full of the true the blastful hypocrine with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth then i might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim so this is the second stanza, another beautiful stanza of this uh, 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 eight stanza poem. So, uh, oh, for a draught of vintage. What is draught? A draught is a quantity of liquid that our mouth can hold to swallow in a single time. So what we can, uh, 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 a gulp, a gulp, a, a kind of um, uh, uh, a quantity of water that we can take or intake into our mouth and at a single time we can swallow that particular quantity of uh, liquid. So a, a drought of vintage. So vintage is uh, something which is old, ancient, sweet wine that is called vintage. 
so uh, 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 drought of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth so a uh, cool deep delved earth this this particular phrase reminds us of keats's right penmanship that keats is really fond of uh, making particular phrases which are fascinating in nature and it is one of the greatest qualities of keats that uh, he uh, invented this kind of uh, 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 compound phrases this kind of it, in, in the first stanza we have seen light winged dryad so light winged uh, not only winged but it is light winged so this kind of compounds are really the uh, innovation of his uh, brain work innovation of his particular legacy so here also we see deep delved earth so deep that means it is uh, it is being dug in a deep way and deep delved earth earth the soil so keats is very fond of this kind of compounds and deep delved earth here means a earth that is deeply dug to keep the uh, uh, vintage wine that means uh, the wines are kept in the cellar under the earth by digging the earth um, um, down uh, almost uh, um, uh, two or three meters so uh, the more the vintage wines will be kept under the earth the more it will be tasteful the more it will be expensive and more it will be uh, worth to take after a few years so it has been cooled a long age in the deep del part means wine that has been kept to mature and to cool deep under the ground so wine uh, it is generally known uh, that wines improve by the uh, passing of the ages if it is kept under uh, underground in a cellar in a deep dale art so it becomes much more uh, uh, worthwhile to uh, take after a few years so keeps wants wine from a cool deep trench in the earth and uh, how does it uh, compare uh, this uh, particular wine is made of so uh, third line testing of flora and the country testing of flora and country green testing of flora and country green so we we know that what is flora and fauna flora is uh, fauna these are all biological terms the uh, flora means the uh, 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 the plant species and fauna is the animal species of a particular uh, um, locality so uh, this uh, um, uh, wine is being made of some uh, kind of uh, um, uh, flowers that have been uh, collected from that particular region and with that uh, flora this particular uh, vintage wine is made of so testing of flora and the country green that means bringing it in association and it reminds the goddess of flowers and spring so uh, the taste of the wine will remind the poet of the flowers with which uh, uh, this particular vintage wine is made of and the next um, uh, next phrase the country green so country green we we know that our country india is divided into several states so similarly in england we find in great britain we find that the country is divided into several counties uh, even we know that country crickets are uh, practiced there even uh, in uh, winter so country means a particular province a particular region a particular so uh, within a particular locality these uh, um, these uh, flowers these uh, uh, trees uh, are being collected to make this particular uh, kind of vintage wine uh, that uh, that particular uh, flowers uh, grown there and their green vegetations grown there in that particular uh, region so in the fourth lines dance and provocal songs and sound bound mark dance and provocal songs the important word is provocal provocal means uh, province is the name of a particular region in the south of france the france the south of france it is famous not only for its delicious wine but it is being loved for its song and dance so provence was the home of medieval songsters singing of love so this particular province is uh, 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 reminds us of a particular uh, music particular dance particular mirth uh, that is being practiced over there and uh, the wine the uh, beverage uh, is also uh, very well known in that particular area 
so marth means joy merry making so sanbant marth means another sanbant marth it is another creation another example of keats's uh, phrase making power keats's penmanship is uh, reflected in this particular phrase uh, this is an instance where it is known that it is also a transferred epithet a sanbant marth so marth is not sanbant but the person who is under the sun and is full of marth is being referred to here so marth means the marth of a sanbant people so keats has not mentioned the people at all yet this phrase brings before our eyes a picture of merry making laughing sanbant peasants those who are enjoying with the dance those who are enjoying with the song of that particular region and they also take the vintage wine while making marth so a generation who celebrates the carnival there in the provokal the southern part of the france so uh, uh, and the sanpan is also a reflection of the uh, dark complexion uh, that grows uh, or turns brown under the sun or the by the scorching heat of the sunlight so uh, the uh, next line line number um, fifth of the second stanza oh for a beaker full of warm sau full of the uh, true the blasphful hypocrite oh for a beaker full of warm sau full of beaker beaker you know beaker is a kind of uh, glass uh, made uh, um, uh, laboratory uh, equipment and it is almost like a glass small glass so a beaker is a large uh, white mouth uh, cup uh, made of glass generally found in our laboratory so it is uh, uh, full of warm south that means uh, the warm south means the uh, warm wine of the southern region the wine that is being produced in the warm region the southern region so it is being warm, it is meant here as warm south so for a beaker full of warm south means um, how i long how the poet how the persona desires to be a cup full of wine of that particular uh, southern uh, region wine so he wants to drink that delicious wine of that uh, southern uh, part of the nation and it is true it is true that, that means it is genuine so uh, it is genuine so um, full of true genuine the blasphful hypocrite this particular phrase that comes uh, into our mind it's a very interesting and it's a very meaningful phrase the blasphful hypocrite so what is blasphful blasphing means uh, the blasphing color uh, blasphing color means a reddish a kind of pinkish color that comes Uh, out of blessing so uh, uh, this particular vintage wine when it is being uh, poured in a beaker uh, so it uh, shows the color of blasphemousness of a particular lady so blasphemousness means a particular color of reddish and pinkish in nature so the word brings before us the rich red color of the wine so hypocrite hypocrite has got an allusion and you have to understand that particular phrase that it is the name of the fountain of the muses it is the name of the fountain of the muses it was struck by the hoof of the winged uh, uh, horse pegasus out of the mount helicon where the muses lived so keeps imagines that this spring ran with wine instead of water so Uh, uh, hypocrite uh, if i uh, explain it a little uh, uh, elaborate way explain uh, hypocrite that needs to be uh, it is the poetic efficacy of a uh, genuine uh, uh, genuine water of hypocrite one of the sacred springs uh, mentioned in the greek greek mythology as a uh, it is the haunting place of the muses whose water was supposed to inspire the drinker to drink uh, to write uh, great poetry genuine poetry so if someone uh, drinks the uh, uh, water of that particular fountain he will be inspired to write a kind of uh, poetry uh, uh, that will uh, flows uh, that will flow spontaneously uh, from the heart of that particular poet so it means that the poet wishes to dream and to aid his imagination but at the same time he would not like to forgo the virtual or uh, visual richness of the wine sparkle color which is not to be found in the mythol mythological water so this is the allusion of hypocrite 
uh, hypocrite and blastful hypocrite means it is full, uh, it is uh, the reddish and pinkish color of that particular wine so blastful hypocrite with beaded bubbles winking at the uh, uh, brain at the brain when the um, uh, wine is being poured in the beaker in the glass uh, wide open glass uh, uh, to the edge so there will be some uh, beaded bubbles and here also uh, reflects a kind of scientific uh, physical uh, concept or physics concept and the beaded beaded bubbles they reflect the lights uh, and the, uh, when the light is being reflected from the bubbles it it becomes a quite sparkling in nature so beaded bubbles winking winking means sparkling at the brim at the edge at the edge of the beaker and purple stained mouth so when uh, the um, uh, that particular vintage wine is being taken and uh, someone who sips that particular wine his um, leaves are uh, also turned uh, pinkies uh, uh, reddies in nature so uh, it is the transformation of the color from the beaker to the leaves so purple strained mouth purple stained mouth and i might drink and leave the world unseen and with the fade away into the forest dim so i might drink and leave the world unseen and with the fade away into the forest dim so uh, what does the poet mean here the poet uh, says that uh, the uh, uh, with this darkness that uh, the poet wishes to drink this uh, wine in order to uh, in order to forget uh, the worldly worries and to escape from from the uh, world of fever fate cares anxieties tension uh, uh, and want to uh, and wants to uh, go above in the into the branch of that particular nightingale where the nightingale has already uh, established his uh, nest so he wants to uh, avoid he wants to elope he wants to go away from the fret and fever of this particular uh, place and wants to merge with the imaginary of uh, the uh, unreal world of the nightingale imaginary world of the nightingale so and um, the mode uh, which he chooses he chooses uh, to take the vintage wine and uh, with that power of wine he wants to transpose himself from that earthly uh, world full of cares and anxieties to the world of happiness the world of imagination the world of romanticism of that nightingale so he wants to escape here we find the Keats's essential sense of escapism that is being reflected which i have already told in my previous lecture and that that escapism is found here in these uh, lines so the poet wants to escape uh, from the uh, earthly world to the world of the nightingale uh, so nightingale's melodious world and now uh, I, I i begin the third stanza fade far away dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves has never known the weariness the fever and the fray here where men sit and hear each other groan here palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies where but to think is to be full of sorrow and laden eye despairs where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love wine at them beyond tomorrow so it's a fascinating stanza uh, full of uh, kitsian symbols kitsian uh, penmanship so fade far away it is uh, the fricative sounds the uh, stanza begins with four 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 it's a fricative sound if we ana analyze the poem stylistically then uh, uh, we see the friction that comes out of this fricative sounds and friction comes out because it is the toil it is the care and anxieties of the earthly world and the poet the persona wants to flee wants to elope want to escape from this world so fade far away dissolve and quite forget that means he wants to forget completely the surroundings of everyday life and want to dissolve that means the poet wants to lose his identity he wants to melt away he wants to dissolve that means he wants to uh, wants to be uh, totally totally forgotten uh, himself from his own existence and 
thou and the next line what thou among the leaves has never known that means the idea is that the while human beings are destined to uh, remain forever full of misery the nightingale does not know the misery and unhappiness what is misery what is unhappiness is not known to the nightingale so nightingale does not know what is misery what is unhappiness the poet envies the bird's complete happiness as selly also does in, in his poem to a skylark so the idea is that the man alone is being weighted here down to the grief and uh, we have also found in tennis's poem lotus eaters also this particular uh, this particular idea we found there so the uh, what thou among the leaves has never known that means the nightingale who is being rested on the uh, hiding on the uh, leaves of a particular branch of a tree he is absolutely uh, not aware about the fates and the fevers and the uh, anxieties tensions of this earthly existence that is being uh, uh, embedded in the heart of the human beings so uh, it is a kind of pathos that comes out in these lines and the third line the weariness the fever and the fret here also for and for the fricative sounds the weariness the fever and the fret here where man seat each seat and hear each other groan seat and each other fear in weariness weariness means weariness means a kind of disgust feeling of being tired and sick of life that is called weariness and fever fever is fever is activities of life restlessness and fret fret means annoyance irritation a kind of trouble that we always encounter in our earthly life so the uh, so the person of the poet wants to convey to us that this earthly existence is full of fret fever anxiety tension restlessness fever is activities uh, sickness everything that uh, embedded in this earthly existence so he wants to uh, avoid this daily world of everyday life and uh, he wants to go to the mm, unreal the fancy world of imagination of the nightingale the line expresses the deep disgust of life he considers life to be full of misery and sorrow he considers uh, it's a tiring struggle a restlessness a kind of pain so uh, the word groan groan means a uh, complaining complaining in a heavy tone that is groaning uh, making a uh, thunderous sound making a loud sound that comes from within so groaning means not only complaining but complaining with a heavy sound so where man groan each other so where men seat and hear each other groan that means uh, it is the dark view of life he feels that the life is nothing but a series of groans and complaints series of groans and complaints so we sit side by side by but we complain of our uh, earthly existence to each other and the next line line number 5 in stanza 3 where pulse is six of few sad last gray hairs so man has become paralyzed diseased in this earthly world and disease is a part of the uh, part of our life part uh, where we lose our strength of our body the central nervous system the nerve become uh, collapsed and the body become paralyzed we cannot control our body we cannot control our nerves so we lead a life of uh, diseased existence and this diseased existence have only some sad last gray hairs so with the passing away of the time with the growing of uh, uh, ages the only few hairs remain on our head so it is uh, uh, the symbol of age it is the symbol of weariness that is being expressed here so this line has also a kind of dark reality of this earthly existence the poet here talks about the old man has having lost all of his hairs and all of his control of his body of his existence due to the diseased uh, existence the diseased um, paralysis paralysis like and the nerve is not working as per uh, the brain uh, wants to do so they are completely helpless so man has become totally helpless in this earthly existence next line where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies youth youth means youth young gentleman and youth grew pale 
that means uh, they are also full of diseases they suffer from uh, diseases they suffer from uh, um, uh, uh, some mental insanity so the young grows pale and spectre things spectre means a kind of ghostly existence so spectre is a ghost so here is another sad picture that is being conveyed by uh, Keats here in this line. The poet in his mind uh, has a uh, biographical, uh, biographical traits that uh, Keats had a brother uh, Tom and who had died out of consumption and at that particular time uh, there were no treatment as such treatment of consumption and people generally die of that particular uh, disease. So, Keats had to uh, face uh, the sad reality of his father, of his uh, brother's demise uh, in consumption. So he had, uh, uh, while writing this poem, he had this uh, sad event at the back of his head, and he said that the young uh, brother, young aged uh, people, young aged gentlemen, they also suffered diseases, and they also uh, uh, had to uh, elope from this earth uh, after uh, uh, being dead. Uh, out of disease. So, uh, uh, um, old, uh, uh, old men as well as young men, they are not uh, devoid of uh, this particular sadness of terrible uh, diseases. So, of course, he forgets that the vast majority of young men also burnt out of their hell. So, uh, what um, uh, what is the next uh, line? The uh, full of sorrow, um, uh, spectre thing. Where but to think is to full of sorrow. So if we if we think about the uh, sad reality, we cannot uh, avoid ourselves. We cannot uh, we cannot uh, detain ourselves from the sad realities of the earthly existence, which is full of fever, which is full of anxiety, tension, and the disease is also there. So uh, uh, it is full of sorrow and laden I despair. So lead, lead is the heavy metal uh, as we have studied in chemistry. So lead in I uh, despair. Despair is also personified and uh, one's uh, eyes are full of dull and heavy with uh, heavy as lead. So lead is a heavy metal. So despair, despair that comes, anxiety that comes into the eyes of a particular person is so heavy that uh, it is uh, it uh, keeps uh, uh, one's eyes closed out of its heaviness. So the poet feels that life is so sad, so unhappy, so dark and disappointing that if we were to think of it, it uh, it would be uh, because of us its deepest pain and sorrow. So only those who are uh, uh, thoughtless they can remain happy. So thoughtless person can remain happy. But those who are sensitive, those who are thoughtful, they cannot remain uh, happy. They, uh, they must face the sad realities of the uh, world. So happiness will come to those persons who are insensitive to these particular feelings. So uh, the last uh, uh, two lines uh, of the third stanza where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes. So beauty is there also personified. So beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes. Lustrous means shining, bright. So I meant keep means to maintain, to retain. So beauty cannot be, uh, beauty ca cannot be uh, 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 kept for uh, the whole life. So beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes. So uh, beauty of a particular lady, beauty of a particular person cannot be uh, cannot be kept for the entire life it may perish and it will perish so beauty will never remain with the person one who is beautiful and the next line or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow so new love love is here also personified and pine means languishing wasting away uh, long eagerly to desire something eagerly so new love pine at them beyond tomorrow so uh, uh, beautiful eyes are referred in the preceding line beautiful lies so uh, beyond tomorrow means more than a single day so like beauty love is also short lived so the lover pines for the beautiful beloved only for a short while very soon she loses her looks and his love for them so love and beauty these are all transient in nature they are very short lived in our earthly existence 
one who is beautiful must uh, forget about his beauty after the passing of years and one who falls in love uh, uh, of that particular beautiful uh, object a beautiful lady uh, will forget uh, of his love for uh, after passing on uh, several years so these are the very transient nature love and beauty in our earthly existence and uh, the last stanza of today's uh, lecture is the stanza number 4 So I read the stanza first. Away, away, for I will fly to the not charioted by beckers and his birds, but on the viewless wings of poesy, through the dull brain, perplexes and returns. Already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on the throne, clustered around by all her starry face. but here there is no light save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through bordeaux glooms and winding mossy ways this is a fascinating poem fascinating stanza so i we i we for i will fly to thee that means uh, till now the poet wants to drink a cup of vintage wine and with the power of that uh, wine he wants to flee the world of this freight fever and anxiety and wants to mingle with the uh, nightingales world uh, on the branch of a tree but right now in this stanza in the beginning of this stanza the poet wants to uh, uh, avoid the point uh, i uh, discourse the idea of uh, being carried away by the uh, power of wine uh, to the world of nightingale so he wants to say that then he i i will fly to the not charioted by backers and his parts that means not charioted that means not riding in the chariot of backers who is backers it is an allusion of greek mythology so it is the god of wine as per the greek mythology he is represented as traveling in a chariot drawn by leopards drawn by birds or tigers so uh, the uh, leopards and panthers are here referred as parts and uh, the poet uh, wants to not to be carried away by this chariot uh, of beckers and want to march to the world of imagination world of unreal uh, uh, um, in the branch of the tree with the nightingale but uh, what he what does he want uh, to do uh, in the third line but on the viewless wings of poesy through the dull brain though the dull brain perplexes and returns so he uh, 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 he gives an alternative avenue uh, of going to the world of the uh, nightingale it is not by the uh, chariot of the beckers but by the viewless wings of poesy now uh, the poet uh, uh, simply in simple word does not want to seek inspiration of uh, drinking wine and he rejects the idea of forgetting his sorrows by drinking wine so he rejects the idea of forgetting his sorrows forgetting his pain by uh, drinking wine so uh, now he uh, uh, opens another alternative avenue of going to the world of nightingale with the viewless that means invisible invisible wings of poesy that means invisible wings of poesy so with the help of poetic inspiration he wants to march with the world of the unreal world of the nightingale so uh, to go to the abode of the nightingale he must have invisible wings of poetry so poetic inspiration and alone can take him to the uh, realm of the entertainment alone can uh, 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 take him to the uh, enchanted world of the nightingale it it must be noted here that its poetry was something very like uh, something very like wine uh, not only uh, for sweeter or more intoxicating not only uh, uh, sweeter and intoxicating Uh, he uh, he was as much addicted to it as others are to wine so he wants to return that mean um, uh, he he says that though the dull brain perplexes and returns so poetic inspiration is not coming straight forward way it hinders the flight of the imagination 
already with thee. Suddenly, in the middle of the stanza, in the fifth line, we see that the poet is already transported to the world of the nightingale, from the world of the reality of the art. So, he says, already with thee, that means he has gone to the world of the uh, nightingale, already with thee. Tender is the night, and from there, uh, he sees the night is tender. It's, it's, a, it's an excellent image, the tactile image. Tactile image means it's a touching sensation. So, uh, uh, night cannot be touched. You cannot touch the night. You cannot feel the night by touching. You, you have to feel the night from other senses. But Keats here says that tender is the night. That means night is so soothing, night is so comfortable and he sees from the branch of the nightingale and looks downward to the earth and he feels that the night is so soothing, so comfortable, so cozy, so uh, so fascinating that it, uh, it fills uh, him with the inspiration of a tactile image that tender is the night. Tender is the uh, uh, night and happily the queen moon, happily, happily means perhaps the queen moon, the queen moon, the full round moon is on her throne. That means the moon is shining on the uh, clear night sky and clustered around by all her starry face. And the, uh, uh, it is the moon, uh, moon is the queen of the night and it is being surrounded, it is being accompanied by the stars and the face, the fairies, fairies means the stars. So the moon which reigns on, uh, uh, as a queen over the sky and it is being surrounded by the fairies, the face, face means fairies and clustered around. The stars are compared to fairies attending on the moon. The stars are here being compared as the uh, companion, attending companion to the moon. Here there is no light. But then the poet suddenly says, here there is no light. That means on the branch of the tree where the nightingale had built uh, the nest, uh, the poet has already transported himself to that particular world of the nightingale and from there on he sees, he looks downward and at that particular place he sees that there is no light. So, uh, earth, there is no light though he sees the moon and the stars in his imagination shining in the sky. Here there is no light. Save, save means accept, save means accept the uh, what forms heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous gloom and winding mossy ways. That means a little bit of light is there and that particular light is coming out of the uh, uh, moon that is shining uh, in the sky and the stars. They, uh, they uh, um, um, give some uh, a little very faint light and that particular light is also coming to the earth uh, when the breezes, a slight breezes blow and the uh, leaves are separated from each other and there remains a little bit of gap and with that gapping the light that comes from the uh, sky and is, uh, um, um, is reflected the, uh, beneath land from the <coughs> branch of the tree. So uh, here uh, um, uh, the poet sees from the uh, entire scene is being um, captured from the branch of a tree and where the nightingale has already built his uh, built a nest. So but here there is no light and what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms, through verdurous, verdurous means, verdurous glooms means darkness caused by numberless trees and their leaves. So, verdurous glooms, uh, glooms means darkness and verdurous, verdurous means the leafy plants. So, it is uh, being the numberless, uh, countless trees uh, that were there in the forest and uh, it is due to those uh, countless trees, the ground remains quite dark. So, uh, the poet says, save what mozzy ways, that means uh, just some rays of light is uh, reached on the earth, reached on the soil where there is a little movement, little busy movement and that particular busy movement separates the uh, uh, leaves from each other and through that particular gapping, that particular separation, the faint light that comes from the sky of the moon and the stars, it uh, gets uh, into the um, earthly uh, world and uh, the earthly world is being lighted a little bit. So, 
how is the uh, earthly world and how um, uh, does it uh, look from the uh, branch of the tree the light penetrates through the leaves falls on the paths overgrown with moss so he sees that the the, uh, the soil is already filled with moss moss mucus pyrogyria uh, as we have uh, already uh, read in uh, biological uh, chapter in our early life so it is full of moss so if this particular place is not haunted by human beings so it is not being treated there so that particular area is full of moss full of uh, spirogyra full of mucus so it is overgrown with this kind of moss so this is one of the finest line of Keats's uh, sensuous uh, imagery, sensuous imagination. So I have explained each and every line of the, uh, of the first four stanzas and I hope uh, you will uh, get uh, real benefit out of each and every uh, meaning of the word, each and every meaning of the line and it will really help in understanding the poem. So uh, this is the first lecture uh, of the poem and the uh, rest four stanzas will be dealt in the uh, next uh, session of my video lecture and there I will explain everything and uh, thereafter you can uh, put your question, you, you can put your uh, suggestion, comments and queries uh, in the comment box as well as you can mail it or uh, you can send uh, in any other form of communication. So I hope uh, this will help and you, uh, you will really enjoy the lecture. So uh, instead of going out of, of your home, uh, you better enjoy this kind of uh, understanding of poetry, understanding of literature through lectures given by your teachers and stay inside, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you everybody.